This is Psych Boost, helping you with your psychology qualification, one video at a time. This video is on neuropsychology, and in this 19th video, we'll be covering the structure and the function of the brain. Now, the very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. A very big thank you for your help, guys, and to join them, follow the link. For everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. Here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. Now let's start with some classic views of the brain. Here we have a top-down view of the brain, so the brain viewed from above, a view of the brain from the side, and a cross-sectional view of the brain from the front. Most of what you can see in the light pink on the side view of the brain is the largest brain structure, the cerebrum. It's at the top of the brain, and what's obvious from the top-down view is the brain is split into two halves called the cerebral hemispheres, one on the left and one on the right. If you're interested in what would happen if we cut the connection between the hemispheres, you can check out my A-level video on just that. The two hemispheres are contralateral, meaning each hemisphere senses and controls the opposite side of the body. If you move your right arm, that was because of a signal sent by the left side of your brain. You can see from my cross-sectional drawing of the brain, there is an outside layer to the brain, and we call that the cortex. It's also called grey matter, as it's mostly cell bodies doing the processing of the brain. The inside, or white matter, is mostly axons, and these are the connections between the neurons. The cerebral cortex is wrinkly, so folded, and this is to increase the brain's surface area, allowing more space for processing. Psychologists divide each cerebral hemisphere into four lobes. Let's identify each one along with some of its functions. The left temporal lobe understands and produces spoken language. The frontal lobe is involved in conscious thought, planning, memory, and logical tasks like problem solving. It also regulates social behavior like facial expressions. The parietal lobe processes touch sensations from around the body and brings together information from other parts of the brain. At the back of the brain is the occipital lobe. This processes visual information coming from the eyes. Now, not one of the lobes, but a separate structure is the cerebrum, and that's found at the base of the brain. It's responsible for functions like balance and coordination. Now, I've outlined the lobes and some of their functions, so what they're responsible for. Now, this idea that the brain's abilities are not evenly spread across the brain, but are located in particular places, is called localization of function. And we should be able to identify a few precise areas of the brain that have particular functions. The motor cortex. Now this runs along the top back of the frontal lobe and it controls voluntary movement. You have one in each hemisphere and the brain is contralateral, so the motor cortex moves the body on the opposite side. The somatosensory cortex runs along each of the parietal lobes. It detects touch sensation from the opposite side of the body. And the visual cortex, one in each occipital lobe, processing visual information. The auditory cortex, one in each temporal lobe processes sound information. And specialist language areas. These are only found in the left hemisphere. Broca's area controls speech production and Wernicke's area is for understanding speech. So, that was a tour of the brain. We'll now look at the work of one of the people who first identified some of those areas. Wilder Penfield, an American-Canadian neurosurgeon. Penfield developed a type of brain surgery called the Montreal Procedure as a treatment for epilepsy. This involved opening up the brain while his patients were conscious. Locating the area the epileptic fit started by electrically stimulating various parts of the brain. When he found the area responsible for the epileptic fits, he would destroy that small area. During electrical stimulation process, the patients would report sensations like smells and visions. So we can say that the aim of Penfield's multi-year study was to investigate how the electrical stimulation of the brain's cortex would be experienced by patients. Over the course of Penfield's long career, he was recorded as conducting the Montreal procedure on 1,132 patients, recording the locations he stimulated with the sensations experienced. He found that stimulating the same areas of the brain in different people produced consistent results. If he stimulated the occipital lobe, he would generate visual images. Stimulating the somatosensory region would produce physical sensations. One area of the temporal lobe he was particularly interested in, when stimulated, seemed to produce memories. This is an area he called 
the interpretive cortex. Penfield concluded from his work that many functions of the brain are localised, and he also concluded that individual memories are stored within the interpretive cortex and can be recalled as stimulation. Now, evaluating Penfield's work, we can agree it was groundbreaking for cognitive neuroscience. Many of his findings from brain surgery were confirmed years later with modern brain scanning techniques like fMRI. So while much of his work has been confirmed, like his maps of the motor and somatosensory cortex, his suggestion that the interpretive cortex contains a perfect recording of a memory and can be fully recovered is seen as a myth. One of the reasons for the weakness of his initial evidence is of his 1,132 patients, only 520 had their temporal load stimulated, and of those, only 40 reported experiences Penfield claimed were recovered memories. And then later research showed 24 of those 40 patients were suffering hallucinations linked to epilepsy. So, not exactly reliable evidence. Now that we've covered the content, you need to be able to use all of that information to actually answer some questions. So here are five questions I've made to test your skills. So, pause the video and give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, I've put together an additional video showing you how to answer these questions properly. For everybody else, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, and I will see you on the next video in neuropsychology, an introduction to neuroscience.